All right, thank you very much. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody here with us today, this afternoon, this evening in Europe and in Russia. Uh, my name is Joshua Tucker. I am the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU. And on behalf of my colleague, Alex Cooley, who's the director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, who you'll be hearing from in a moment, we're welcoming all of you to the, our session today on Navalny and the Kremlin, politics and protest in Russia. Um, I don't have to tell any of you that it's been a very, very eventful last, I guess, two, almost two weeks now, but certainly last uh, couple of weekends and then a few days before that in Russian politics. Um, what we're bringing you today is, a, is the latest in set, uh, edition of, or I guess we're calling it an emergency session of what is called the New York City Russia Public Policy Series. This is a seminar series that's jointly run by the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia and the Harriman Institute at Columbia with generous support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And uh, it's called the New York City Russia Public Policy Series because prior to the pandemic, we were trying to have an event for people who were in New York City to bring together um, scholars and practitioners to talk about important areas of, of public policy in Russia. But of course, since the uh, pandemic has started, this has been open to a much broader and much more global audience. So it's great to see so many of you with us here today. Um, we've been running about these approximately once a month and you can find out about them at the Harriman Institute uh, website as well as at the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia's website. We'll put links to both of those in the, in the, uh, in the um, chat function here of the, of the Zoom webinar and we'll have it as well on, the, on their YouTube page. So without further ado, uh, it's a great pleasure to have all of you here. I'm gonna pass this over to my colleague, Alex Cooley, who is going to introduce our panelists. Um, and just to give you a heads up, we're going to do the panelists, we're gonna give you introductions one at a time in the efforts of to keep this sort of smooth and moving forward. There will be chances for question and answer uh, during, uh, after the panelists have spoken. Uh, what we request is that you use the Q&A button, uh, which you can find at the bottom of the Zoom button. You can also use comments on YouTube if you're watching it on YouTube to ask questions and then Alex and I will moderate the questions once each of the speakers have gone through and given opening remarks. So thanks for being here. Over to you, Alex. Yeah, thanks so much, Josh. And thanks again to the panelists for joining us. Each of them has made some unique and very insightful interventions on what has transpired over this remarkable last um, two weeks. So we will just go in the order um, of the speakers in order to save time. We will post their bios in the chat. Um, first up is Dr. Yana Gorokovskaya, who is currently a research fellow at the Institute of Modern Russia and a former postdoctoral scholar here at the Harriman Institute. So it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome her back. Uh, she is uh, published in a number of different outlets, uh, had a, a hard hitting piece in The Guardian uh, on uh, recent events. Uh, Yana, the floor is yours. Thanks, Alex and Josh, for the invitation. I'm very glad to be back at Harriman, even if it is virtual. Um, although it's, it's there's 18 inches of snow falling in New York, so maybe it's actually better that it's virtual this time around. Um, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and put the events of the last 10, 10 days or so, two weeks, in a little bit of context. Um, and I'm going to cover three broad themes. So one is, what seems like it's new about these protests, at least what seems like it's new to me about these protests. Two, how does Navalny's plight compare to the general situation with civil society in Russia? And three, looking forward a little bit, what is the impact um, of these protests on Russia's sort of political future? So to begin, um, start with the protests. There's protests uh, last or yesterday, last weekend also. And I'll leave it to the other speakers to talk maybe a little bit about protest size, protest participants, um, social media. I'm gonna talk about the regime's response. So in general, the regime um, has a toolkit of protest responses, and we're really familiar with it now. Um, it starts with denying permits for protests, so making them unsanctioned rallies. Then we have arrests of any uh, potential protest leaders, protest organizers, preemptive arrests. Then we have pressure on teachers, employers, university instructors to discourage attendance to, pro to for protests, to suggest that um, you may endanger your job or your university education by attending protests. Then we have using state media to spread propaganda about protests being um, you know, uh, funded for, by, by foreign powers or some kind of provocation. Uh, and then we have the very rough treatment of protesters when they're being detained. Um, 
and uh, various threats to, to parents for bringing their children or for allowing their children to attend protests. So those are all um, kind of tactics that we're familiar with. And they all happened um, in these two last uh, protests. So what's new? I'd say what's new is the incredible securitization of the, of especially Moscow and St. Petersburg that we saw this past weekend. So if you saw pictures of authorities uh, preparing for the protests, we saw that downtown Moscow was almost completely shut down. Um, and they shut down the subway stops, they, they shut down major boulevards, there were checkpoints, uh, you know, every couple of meters for people um, to pass through on foot. So this, this is new. I mean, so I'm not an expert on, on, uh, on um, metro history, but I, I did see someone observe that the last time the, the, the metro in downtown Moscow was shut down was in October of 1941, when the German army was outside the city and they were contemplating flooding and blowing up the, the subway to abandon it basically so that the Germans couldn't take it. So the shutting down the metro in Moscow is a big deal. And shutting down the, the city in this way is also a big deal. And it suggests that for the regime, these protests are serious, that they are taking this very seriously. Um, so I'll move on to my second point. There are some narratives around Navalny's return to Russia that suggest that this return um, is somehow putting him on a collision course with the Kremlin, that he is really accelerating this confrontation. But from my perspective, looking at the uh, sort of events that have been happening in Russia over the last couple of years, it seems that the Kremlin has taken a very aggressive line towards Russia's civil society. Um, and that, that trend has actually per uh, precipitated what's happened to Navalny more recently. So just a couple examples. I'm sure most people are familiar with the foreign agents law that was adapted in 20, 2012, which has since been expanded to apply to foreign media, um, to individuals, and there are new draft uh, laws that would expand it even further to apply to informal organizations um, and even political candidates running for office so that you'd have to actually wear the label of foreign agent on a ballot. People's right to assembly has also been greatly restricted over the last couple of years. So people can be charged with more crimes for participating in protests like blocking traffic. They face more serious um, penalties of up to five years for participating in three unsanctioned rallies in a single year. And there are new changes uh, that make things like single person pickets illegal. And this was one of the remaining kind of avenues for people to protest um, spontaneously without receiving prior permission. And then if we just, if we step back from that too, the constitutional amendments that happened last year, I think the most attention was devoted to the fact that they basically swept away presidential term limits for Putin. But um, what else they did was they, they pretty much ended judicial independence for the Supreme and constitutional courts. And they, um, they made it possible for Russian authorities to ignore the rulings of international courts and international treaties. And these are often tools that civil society uses to defend itself against the, the government. And so Navalny's poisoning, his return to Russia, his arrest, these protests should all be seen in this, um, this wider context of growing repression. So now I'll turn to my final point. Predicting the future is notoriously difficult and political scientists shouldn't attempt it, I think. So I'll, I'll say that the only thing I know about the future is that I'm pretty sure Putin is never going to live in that seaside palace now that it's been um, exposed. But what can we expect uh, from these protests? I think anytime protests break out in Russia and, or in other authoritarian states, there's some hope or expectation that they might lead to regime change. Um, but the reality is that Putin's been in power for 21 years. He's withstood a number of protest waves that were very significant. He's withstood international sanctions, falling income levels. And it's absolutely true that Russians today are economically worse off than they were um, some time ago, uh, especially about 10 years ago. But they are better than the better off than they were in the 1990s, which is Putin's kind of favorite point of comparison. I think Sergei Guryev recently wrote that Russian incomes are about 10% lower now than they were in 2013. The problem is that the regime durability rests only partially on popular support. And you do need popular support to win elections because you can't uh, steal so many votes as to make it kind of implausible that you actually won. But popularity kind of matters less when you're trying to repress uh, dissent. 
To repress dissent, what you really need is cohesion among the elite and you need loyalty from the security forces. And it seems like Putin has both right now. But I'd like to end on a more pos uh, positive or optimistic note. Protests that don't accomplish regime change still have long lasting consequences. And so the protests of 2011, 2012, so almost 10 years ago, we saw produced a great number of new civil society organizations, new political forces, new electoral technologies, and all of these things are blossoming today, um, including Navalny's smart vote system. Navalny's own presidential campaign in 2017, 2018, that was unsuccessful, um, grew this network of organizations across the country that are still active today. And in part, they're organizing these protests, but also really importantly, they're training and educating politically active youth in all across Russia. So all of these developments are really important and they get to, and they, they tend to get overlooked when we're looking at, or we're hoping for kind of a quick take on protests. And I think the reality is that democratic revolutions seem sudden, but they're actually built on a foundation of incremental progress. And that's what we're, we're seeing and that's what we should look forward to in the future. And I'll end there. Thanks very much. Yana, thanks so much. Um, so our next speaker, uh, we go to Pyotr Sauer, who's a reporter covering Russian politics and society at the Moscow Times. Uh, his coverage of the coronavirus crisis in Russia received special recognition from the American Society of Journalists and Authors. And Pyotr was kind enough to join us over the summer when we were talking about COVID in Russia. And he's been at the forefront of reporting on the protests. And we're very thankful you can make some time to join us today. Pyotr, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, um, and I hope you guys can hear me well. Um, to start with, I'd like to sort of um, give some context as to where Navalny stands in the eyes of the Russians, uh, what his popularity is, and then I would like to go into talk a little bit about my experiences uh, of the last two weeks covering both protests. Um, so obviously, there's always a lot of debate, uh, both in Russia and outside of Russia, what Navalny stands for and what his popularity is in Russia. Um, you know, some try to uh, claim that he's more popular than Putin, while uh, Putin himself uh, never mentions his name, uh, says who, who needs him anyway, as, uh, as uh, Putin said during uh, the, his last press conference, he ne never names him, tries to downplay him as much as possible. Uh, the reality is very nuanced. Um, in polls uh, looking at uh, Navalny as a presidential candidate, he usually ranks low. He receives, uh, he's in the lower double, uh, lower single digits. Um, two, three percent of Russians say uh, that they would like to see him as a president. Um, but uh, if you frame the question differently, um, we see different results. Uh, a very important poll is, has been the Levada poll in uh, September, that, uh, where Navalny received 20 percent approval rating. Uh, that's the highest we've seen uh, Navalny uh, Navalny's popularity has been. Um, and we really see an upward trend in here. Uh, another uh, very interesting poll, in my opinion, that was shared with me uh, by the Levada. Levada is a sociological center in uh, Russia, the only independent sociological center left. Another very interesting poll was uh, when, when it was asked, who is the person of the year? Uh, to Russians. And um, interesting enough, among uh, the age group between 18 and 24, Navalny uh, received 13% uh, compared to Putin who received 15%. So this is within the margin of error. Um, so you, you could say for uh, the youth, Putin has, Navalny has reached the level of popularity as Putin. Navalny also ranked second uh, in this question amongst entrepreneurs and managers, uh, so sort of he's, his, his base is growing um, rather quick. And if, if, if uh, you talk to sociologists now, they believe that these protests, um, the dramatic poisoning and his arrival here have only increased his recognition and possibly increased his uh, approval. So I think that's a interesting start uh, to go into when sort of analyzing Navalny and when analyzing his protests, that, that his popularity is still small, but is growing uh, and is growing rather quickly. Um, then uh, the, 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 the two protests that uh, have so far been organized by Navalny supporters, um, 
they they've been very different. Uh, the one the first one um, was a sort of they were both unsanctioned, which is very important to realize. Uh, in Russia, sanctions and unsanctioned protests have a very different character. Uh, at an unsanctioned protest, you're very likely to be arrested. Uh, there are no almost no uh, posters. The atmosphere is quite intense. It can be quite grim. Um, there's less less. Uh, there's no speeches. Um, so uh, for the first protest we've seen, uh, uh, Reuters estimated that 40,000 people came to that protest, which is a very large number for an unsanctioned protest. Uh, some estimate that it's the biggest uh, protest, unsanctioned protest in Moscow seen in 10 years. And what really, really struck my eye was the fact that protesters were actually fighting back um, against police. That is something that we haven't seen um, that I haven't seen during the 2019 uh, summer protests that, that happened um, because of uh, election manipulation or perceived election manipulation in the uh, in the local Duma. So what, what we've seen in these protests that the protests were fighting back. They were more aggressive. Um, you could argue more desperate uh, for change, uh, less scared, uh, even though the authorities clamped down hard or even harder than in 2019. Um, the makeup of the of the protesters was also slightly different than 2009, the summers of 2019. Uh, about 45 to 50 percent of protesters said it was their first protest. So you had a whole different crowd of people that wasn't there before, which I think is uh, pretty significant. Um, the, the the big difference between uh, the first and uh, the protest on uh, last Sunday was that it was the last Sunday's protest was more chaotic. Um, it wasn't organized at Pushkin Square as, as, as the, the previous one in the center of Moscow. This one was supposed to happen at Lyubanka uh, in front of the FSB building, which was a very daring decision by, uh, by Navalny's uh, allies to do. Um, and so it became quite clear from the start that it would be very hard to organize a protest right there. Um, the whole city was completely militarized. Uh, the, 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 as Jana said, closing down the metros it was an unprecedented step. Um, so the protest ended up being, um, you could compare it to the Belarus protests uh, in some ways. Um, I've, I've been to both. And what really struck me was the, the fact that the, the, you had clutches of people all around the city running away from uh, from police being picked out by one two people being uh, being beaten up. Um, we've we've heard of accounts in all around Russia in Vladivostok in Kazan, uh, in Chelyabinsk of uh, protesters being also tortured. Um, there's been uh, gas used in St. Petersburg. So we've sort of seen new elements of the protest that experts are comparing to the Belarusian style of uh, repressions, which um, you know, should worry human rights uh, defenders. Um, but what, what I think uh, might be a, uh, a consequence that the government wasn't maybe expecting or isn't happy about is that everyone here in Moscow can't ignore these protests anymore. In the sense that every, even those citizens that were apolitical now, uh, their daily life has been completely changed by these protests. You couldn't walk the street without knowing what's happening because the whole st the, the central streets were blocked off. So this really forces people to pick a side um, and it sort of becomes a really a daily, um, a daily phenomenon. Uh, and the question is how long will this enthusiasm uh, last among the protesters to keep this going? Tuesday, tomorrow will be a huge day, of course. We will find out what will happen to uh, Navalny. Um, but either way, sort of the, 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 this protest atmosphere that we've seen in the summer of 2019 is completely back in, in the picture in, in Moscow, I think. Piotr, thanks very much. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Gulnaz uh, Sharafuddinova, who is a reader in Russian politics at King's College uh, in London. And she is also author of The Red Mirror, Putin's Leadership and Russia's Insecure Identity published um, recently last year. 
um, and also previous contributor to the series. So uh, Gulnaz, uh, welcome back. Uh, what's your take on events? Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for having me uh, in this great discussion. It's, uh, I want to also reiterate uh, Yana's points and your point, Alex, that we are in the middle of sort of a roller coaster events and a very tense moment uh, in Russia. And of course, we all want to know what these processes mean and how close they might be to bringing change. And so let me just also share my understanding of what I, where I see some changes and where are the continu continuities. And maybe while Yana focused a lot on the regime response, let me focus more on the societal uh, level and talk more about um, what's new and what's the same in the society. Uh, but uh, for the first point, let me um, sort of share my understanding that I think we are seeing a new political moment uh, in Russia, which has been forced in by Navalny's decision to return and his arrest and the documentary. Uh, one, um, uh, someone compared Navalny's uh, choice and he obviously has, has to make a choice because the authorities didn't want him to come back. He made a choice to return and this, this was a courageous uh, action. Someone compared it, uh, how he put his head in the jaws of the lion and then started poking that lion uh, at the same time. And indeed the day after the arrest when the documentary uh, uh, shoot out with over 100 million people uh, watching it and uh, a lot of people in Russia obviously uh, learning a lot of new things. Um, although for many people it wasn't that new either, but anyway it was a big um, slap on the face of, uh, of, of the Kremlin's leadership of course. So uh, that action became a mobilizer for street protests, but at the same time uh, there were many structural issues that were ongoing that were leading to growing uh, sentiments and um, grievances against the regime. Of course, this is uh, the economic stagnation that we are observing from about 2013, right? Uh, growing inequality that we have been observing for a long time. Uh, the impunity of state authorities that has been demonstrated over and over with various um, anti-protest activities as well as just a single um, uh, uh, arrests and things like that. And uh, of course, the pandemic uh, played also um, uh, a big role in exacerbating the grievances uh, among the people. But first of all, I do see a very strong moral motivation of Navalny's action and the recognition uh, of Navalny now uh, as, you know, a real Mm, not, not an alternative to Putin, but if there is anyone, then it's Navalny. I think we, we um, you know, while many people have criticized Navalny and still criticize Navalny for his past views, etc., but everyone has to now, uh, you know, uh, agree on the point that uh, if there is one focal point around which protest against the regime can consolidate, it is Navalny. And from that perspective, his leadership, Navalny's position in the political spectrum in Russia has, uh, I think, acquired a qualitatively new sort of stage. Uh, so, and we could see the, this moral motivation of protests in the slogan that I'm hearing a lot uh, in various cities in Russian. Um, it's один за всех и все за одного. One for all and everyone for one, right? And that solidarity uh, that we see in the protests inside Russia, uh, in outside Russia, uh, and that solidarity in that slogan, again, that solidarity was something that I see as a reaction, you know, as, as just a, a reaction to that moral sense that has that is being uh, woken up uh, in, in the society. Now, uh, starting with such a sort of optimistic view, I want to now shift to greater pessimism. The protests are not as numerous as they could be. Now, the new element that we see in the protests is that we see them beyond uh, uh, Russia's uh, uh, capital and St. Petersburg. And that has been something, you know, people going out in Kazan, 
two weeks in a row in Nizhny Novgorod, in Yekaterinburg in big numbers, in Novosibirsk in big numbers, in Vladivostok, in Krasnodar, Barnaul. I think for the 23rd of January, 170 cities were uh, mentioned as uh, sites of protest. I haven't seen a specific number for, for the 31st uh, of January protests yet. So that's definitely something new we see. And again, this is both a reaction, as I said, to I think Navalny's action, but also I think a reflection of the mobilizational organizational potential of Navalny's um, uh, staff around the country. It, it's the, again, it, it's the work that has been done before, prior to these events, and now we see this um, uh, result of that work. Now, but the numbers matter, right? Um, and uh, the numbers, uh, I mean, the numbers we see are different depending on whether it's the official uh, sources or uh, Navalny's um, uh, uh, people who uh, give larger numbers. Now for, uh, for the 23rd of January, I saw the number of around 150,000 around the, around the country, right? Uh, but uh, to my understanding, the protests uh, of Sunday for, on 31st were smaller and we're talking about um, maybe uh, um, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, it's I don't I don't see any clear information, but um, the, uh, the 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 intensity, the numbers on the streets have diminished, despite the uh, while the regime response and the preparedness and the uh, level of uh, repression has increased. Right. So there are jokes uh, on the media that how can you have uh, many more detained people while the number of protesters are much lower lower than uh, it was before, but the number of those who were detained and arrested and uh, put into uh, aftersacks are is larger. Now, for the from the uh, regime's perspective, it is important, right, what numbers we have outside. And um, unfortunately, there my uh, sense is quite pessimistic from the perspective of what does it mean for, uh, uh, for you know, what signal it gives to Putin and to the Kremlin in terms of what to do with Navalny on the court hearings that we're expecting tomorrow, right? And um, uh, I, I am a bit pessimistic about uh, the fact that the Kremlin saw the numbers going down despite the fact that people were out, but the, um, the numbers going down means that um, they, they, they believe they can crush the protest. They believe, the Kremlin believes that, uh, you know, they can uh, manage uh, the protests. And um, I, I'm, um, we will see. And that's another important point that we are, it's very hard to make predictions because we're in the middle of processes that are ongoing. And I think, you know, the next step is what's going to be decision in the court with regard to Navalny's freedom and how the society will react to that decision, right? How people will react to that decision. From my perspective, the regime might be a little bit overconfident about that their uh, opportunity to crush uh, uh, the protests, even if they uh, do not free Navalny. And that seems like uh, one of the things that's uh, probably is likely to happen. Uh, but again, there is uncertainty as to what's, uh, what's expected. Now, my last point is about big inertia in the society, right? So we do see generational um, split that, um, if I am correct, around 70% from, at least from the uh, polls done, uh, from the surveys, interviews done in Moscow, about 70% of those who protest are under 35 years old. Right, which tells us about uh, also mobilizational strategies and the role of Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook in mobilization, but also about just the probably not, it's not a naivety, but this, um, you know, clean response with regard to the moral choices that people have and how the, uh, the younger are less encumbered in terms of their pragmatism, in terms of their pessimism and skepticism, in terms of their, um, uh, in terms of their responsibilities, uh, you know, in life, uh, many older people who might still, you know, might be very critical of the regime will not go out because they might be afraid of losing jobs and, you know, uh, but also explaining and rationalizing their choices to themselves as just uh, being, you know, uh, nothing will happen, uh, you know, changes are not possible. And if, even if changes come, the next government will still be corrupt, etc. So that 
inertia is that big inertia is still there and the Kremlin's propaganda machine is really hoping for the continuation of that inertia too. So we see generational shifts. We know where the future is going, but the present is still very much encumbered by that um, strong burden from the past, from the present, from the uh, work of the propaganda machine and from just the living conditions and problems that lead to a certain societal de depression. The winter, when this is my last point, when we assess the numbers being low, we need to position them in the context that this is happening actually in the context of rather depressed society, depressed by years of economic stagnation, depressed by understanding that change is difficult, that corruption is widespread, and depressed by the pandemic as well. So having all these people out also means a lot. Thank you. Well, nice. thanks so much. So those of you who follow um, our series with Josh know that we uh, like to try and bring in experts on social media. It reflects also my colleague's groundbreaking work in his social media lab here at NYU. But I think we're also both of the mind that um, it's important to have rigorous uh, social scientific analysis of social media trends and what they reveal about episodes like this. So to that end, we're really lucky today to have Dr. Alexander Orman uh, join us, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Communication and Media Studies at the University of Bern and Social Computing Group University of Zurich. And she employs computational methods to examine various aspects of political communication on social media. And she's prepared a, a presentation for us today. Uh, Alexandra, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for ha having me. And I'm going to start sharing my screen now. And I'm going to be, as I go, skipping some technical details. Uh, uh, just to keep to the time, but I'm sure that um, I will be able to share the slide deck later with uh, those interested. Um, so you should see my screen now. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the current protests uh, on TikTok and Telegram, um, and I will jump right in. So first, a grain of salt. I don't have data on all TikToks posted there for various technical reasons, but uh, I seem to have uh, the most popular videos uh, and a lot of them, and it seems to be capturing the general trends. So um, I guess the question that many have been asking in the recent weeks, uh, ever since we saw reports on the politicization of TikTok is, will we see a TikTok drop? My short answer is actually no. Um, so what the data suggests is that what we have seen on TikTok is not a sustained mobilization or sustained politicization, but, but more of a short-lived hype. Um, so we have seen that um, after Navalny arrived to Russia on uh, December 17th, there was an, a rapid increase in the number of TikToks with hashtag Navalny and associated hashtags like um, posted on and it skyrocketed kind of by TikTok numbers um, uh, after Navalny released uh, the video about Putin's palace. And here you can see a graph of basically the distribution of TikToks posted every hour starting on January 18th. But here you can also see that it uh, dropped significantly after January 23rd, so after that protest, and then it continued like dropping and now it's quite negligible. Um, okay, so this mobilization was seemingly short-lived, but is this something new? So uh, many people were discussing that we haven't really seen something like this before, and actually the answer is no, we have. Uh, it just was less in Khabarovsk. Uh, where the TikToks, um, TikTok videos in support of Furgal, uh, the arrested ex-governor of Khabarovsk, were posted in bulks uh, when he, once he was arrested. And then there was a, a subsequent cool down, just like we see with Navalny activity, though the activity in this case seemingly lasted a bit longer because this is a daily graph starting in July and going till now, basically. Uh, but again, we still see that it started very rapidly and there was like, you know, this huge trend and then it died out as it went on. And I'll mention on uh, what I think, like the reasons behind, uh, uh, the reasons why I think TikTok driven mobilization is not going to be sustainable. But first, let's see what was actually happening, even if it was short lived. Um, so how posting activity developed here, uh, you can see a graph again, a uh, number of TikToks posted by our, the blue line is Navalny hashtag and uh, the red line is pro Putin uh, hashtag or for Putin. 
And uh, so, as I said, after Navalny arrived uh, to Moscow, the number started rising, and then it uh, started like rising even further after the release of the video with the palace. But then one day later, we see that this uh, for Putin hashtag suddenly comes in. And I have a hunch that it's not organic, so it's paid for videos, it seems like, at least some of them. Uh, there were media reports on that, uh, that like people are now going and uh, buying some for Putin um, videos, offering money to TikTokers, essentially. Also, like in my data set, I see that there are a couple of users who are posting dozens of uh, videos with this hashtag per day, and they are like, you know, very similar videos. And these videos don't receive much engagement. So an average video for Putin receives uh, over 60,000 views, and for Navalny, almost half a million views. So also, you know, there is not much motivation for an average TikToker to post videos that don't uh, receive much engagement. Um, so that's why I think that not all of this, at least, are organic. But um, also, even though after January 23rd, the activity uh, subsided a bit, there was also a, a big distinction in the topics addressed by the most popular TikToks before the protests happened and as they were happening and a couple of days after. So uh, before the popular topics were, uh, first of all, stuff that Navalny kind of endured from the Russian authorities, so all the numerous assaults on Navalny. Um, then the second one was the, uh, I think now famous, thanks to the media, Putin portrait challenge, where school kids are taking down Putin's portraits in high schools and are replacing them with Navalny's portraits sometimes, sometimes just taking down Putin's ones. Um, another one is video compilations of Navalny and Yulia Navalny. Uh, so this, the whole narrative of him, of them being the cute loving couple and having this amazing relationship. Another one is, of course, the palace after the palace was, uh, the palace video was released. And this like what I call protest starter pack. So uh, people preparing for protests uh, or saying that they will join the protests or what they should take with them for the protests. Uh, and then after January 23rd, this changed. And what we see is all centered on the police active actions. So it's people fleeing from the police or clashes with the police, then, um, or police violence, then clashes with the police, like this video of now arrested Said Jumaev, who was fighting the riot police in Moscow. Uh, this particular video gathered over 9 million views and not so much of a topic because as there is actually just one video like that because that's not a common phenomenon but the most popular video in my data set with over 10 million views as, as of yesterday night um, is how in Chita police refused to disperse the crowd and people were thanking them for that so um, yeah but after January 24th the activity dropped and could it be connected to the actions of the Russian uh, um, uh, entity that surveils the communication. So Roskomnadzor, who requested from TikTok and other social media to take down protest related content. It's super hard to say, because again, I don't have all the TikTok videos due to technical reasons, and I'm not gonna read out this whole slide, but um, what I, how I can sum it up. It seems that at least for me with my Swiss IP, most videos are accessible among uh, 1,200 videos that uh, I checked and our student assistant checked, uh, only 100 were not accessible anymore. Uh, again, from Switzerland, I'm not sure how it is in Russia, but 82 were actually set to private. And it seems that more popular users uh, tend to be the ones setting their videos to private. So it might be that uh, Roskomnadzor's actions might not, ha might not have, um, might have led to self-censorship among other things, and maybe the police crackdowns. Um, but another, like, I guess, uh, the platform itself is just not too conducive towards protest mobilization in long term. First of all, it's too algorithmic. So TikTok's recommendation algorithm decides what gets popular and what a person sees, and it's difficult to control that. There is no space for coordination and deliberation, so no group chats or anything like that. People come to TikTok for entertainment. Nobody is expecting to see uh, the full feed of political content in long term. And videos are quite long to um, post because one needs to record them and act. Um, and the trends on TikTok tend to switch quite fast, like in general. So trends are short-lived. 
but we'll always have Telegram and Telegram kind of checks all these boxes. So there is no algorithmic filtering. What gives users full control over what they see. It's already politicized. Russians are used to getting political content from Telegram. Um, there is ample space for coordination and deliberation and it's fast to post. And Telegram is resilient to outages, attempts to block it and Pavel Durov won't uh, process takedown requests from the Russian authorities. Um, at least not on opposition related content. So what's going on in Telegram? I'm going to jump through this super quickly. Um, we see sharp rises in the number of views for Navalny's and Navalny's team's channels in all regions except Habarovsk. Um, so uh, the bottom graph here is Habarovsk and this is a number of views averaged by day. Um, and you can see that, uh, well, basically when Furgal was arrested, the activity was much more, um, like there were more views for Navalny's team's channel in Habarovsk than there are now. But everywhere else we see sharp rises and if in Moscow and St. Petersburg, these rises are comparable um, to the events of uh, the summer of 2019 when we have seen previous protests in Russia, uh, in other regions, this rise is actually uncomparable. This above is Irkutsk, I think, and below is Nizhny Novgorod, but this similar pattern persists on all the other like channels that I looked at, where we see that this like rise in the number of views for these channels is unprecedented. Uh, nothing like this happened before. Uh, also increased view numbers on NGOs or media that cover the protests, like Over the Info or TV Rain, and the most Popular posts from uh, such media and NGOs are those that are related to the uh, number of arrested people or to police violence. So to sum it all up, that's the last slide. Um, so TikTok's politicization seemingly was short-lived and the activity has been going down since January 23rd. It's difficult to say if it's because of how the platform works or it's Roscommonadzor's actions or police violence or everything together. But on Telegram, we're seeing star stark increases in the popularity of Navalny's team's channels, especially regional channels. It's unclear if it will be sustained, though, and if there is some ceiling effect after which it won't grow anymore. Maybe we have reached the ceiling, maybe no. Uh, and one overarching topic that attracts a lot of attention on both platforms is police violence. So um, I would say that mobilization potential lies, like there is a lot of mobilization potential in this specific topic rather than just broadly corruption-centered or Navalny-centered or pol uh, political prisoner-centered narratives. And that's it. Thank you. Super. Thanks so much for that. Um, let's now Stop. jump Stop. right. Wait. Yep. Perfect. Let's jump right now to the Q&A. We already have some questions in, <clears throat> in the Q&A function. And uh, I'll ask uh, Josh to jump right in and uh, ask the first question. Great, and we're gonna. I, I'm gonna ask the first question, give a few people more chance to to throw questions up in the Q and A, and then I'll start taking questions from the Q and A. And Alex and I go back and forth asking them. But I want to just start with one one quick follow up question to Alexandra er Erman. So thank you so. Thanks first of all, thanks to all the panelists. This has been fantastic already. Like it just incredibly, incredibly useful. And I I have 20 questions I want to ask myself. But um, Alexandra, when we you know one when we talk about studying social media and politics. We always talk about social media as two things. One, it's a source of, it's a variable that we can put in our models that social media may be something to be explained or that is explaining things, but it's also data in that it gives us sort of unprecedented windows into what's going on. So I was struck by your discussion of the platform affordances of Telegram and TikTok and the sort of nature of TikTok as being this ephemeral and things come in quicker and leave quicker. And so I would, you know, there's, you know, a lot, I mean, when we first started getting, you know, going back to someone who studied colored revolutions and then first kind of got exposed to social media with the Moldova Twitter revolution, right? Which then ended up being much less about Twitter. But I, I wonder if in these particular, you know, we always talk about the role of social media and protests. And I wonder your sense from looking at this now, and I'm happy to have anyone else jump in on this as well, um, is, in this particular case, is social media like an important variable? Like if we want to understand why these protests are taking place, where they are, whether they will continue to take place, people's organizational efforts on social media are going to be key to this, which we do think they were like, for example, in Euromaidan, they played an important role in organizational efforts there. Or 
is social media in this particular case just a useful sort of it's it's like the effect of what's going on is that when there's a there is a change in sentiment in the country and we can see that on social media and so we may see social media if there's less attention like people you know if uh, building off of Gulnaz's point that like there were few if there were fewer people participating in the protests the second week we can kind of glean that from social media but it's not that social media is causing it so in your sense in this particular case is like is is, is TikTok and I'll say Telegram as well, is it important to understand as a sort of explainer of what's driving these protests? So going back to the point that was made, I forget who made it before, maybe Piotr, that we have, or maybe it was Goldas, that's, you know, such a large percentage of people are new participants and are under the age of 35. Well, that that would make sense. I, I, I get TikTok to look at funny videos. I see some important political stuff out there. I go join a protest for the first time. I'm more likely to do that if I'm young. All of those things kind of make sense from a TikTok perspective, from a perspective of the social media driving the protests. Or is it the alternate story here that like what, what's going on here is that there's a larger sort of shift in society and social media is just kind of a good place for us as social scientists to go to look into it and to get a sort of uh, get a, a window into what's going on. So I'd be interested in your thoughts and then anyone else who wants to jump in on that and then we'll move to the audience questions. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's kind of a little bit of both, but I would say that it's definitely like uh, I'm far from this, like, you know, technology deterministic point of view that like, you know, it's TikTok or Telegram or Twitter or Facebook driving the protests. Uh, these are certainly useful tools. I would say that some are more useful than others. There is fortunately more useful than TikTok for um, uh, coordination specifically, um, but we can't say like obviously access to information like um, the way social media can kind of drive protests is through increased access to information and also through convincing people that they are like not alone that uh, there is enough uh, people who are willing to join the protests. I think TikTok in this sense or at least like uh, the media coverage of TikTok uh, was quite useful because people were reporting that. Uh, the only thing that they see in their TikTok feed is now related to Navalny, which certainly gave them the feeling that kind of there is enough people or a lot of people um, talking about that, and probably all of them will go to the street, or at least like you know a lot of them. It's not going to be like ten uh, supporters of Navalny. Um, and in that sense, Telegram is also useful because we know that um, you know uh, the freedom of speech and the freedom of media in Russia is obviously um in decline <laughs> to put it that way and telegram in that sense uh gives away and other social media obviously give away to um spread information quickly and during the protests it's very necessary to spread information quickly like what i've been noticing during this protest i, I was reading like a couple of different media outlets plus telegram channels that telegram channels were normally faster because even journalists would directly post to telegram and Again, given the police crackdowns and um, how the protests take, pl take place in Russia, having fast and rapid access to information is obviously helpful. But I can't say like that, you know, uh, social media driving protests. I think Gulnaz wants to. Add. Yes, I want to jump in. I think great question, Josh. And, you know, I think it's hard not to give actually an independent variable role to social media and TikTok, specifically if we look at how effective it is in, in a short amount of time, bring up and highlight the emotions and sentiments. So to the extent that, you know, uh, kids and uh, adults and whoever is going after these TikToks, uh, you know, messages, they don't have to read, you know, you have this several seconds but the sentiment is so clear and it becomes an amazing mechanism for sharing and creating collective shared sentiment and emotion then then is used for mobilizing. So as a coordination point and again as an appeal to collective emotion, how do people know that there are so many millions or hundred thousands who share the same sentiments? So it's a really good mechanism and tool and I think Navalny's team is also uh, understanding and uh, using using it um yeah yeah Piotr? yeah i think yeah i completely agree with uh, what just Gunnar said and something from a more practical perspective uh it's worth remembering that all the protest leaders at the moment are either in jail under house arrest 
or in hiding. So in that sense, Telegram is, at this point is vital. And I was actually surprised to see that the internet wasn't completely cut off uh, on Sunday. Uh, it was cut off last Saturday, but on this Sunday, people could freely access it. And without Telegram, they wouldn't be able to move it to the prison where Navalny was, was staying at Matryoshka Tishna. So it's important to, you need Telegram when you don't actually have people leading the protest on the ground because they're gone. Thanks so much. Yeah, those are super helpful responses. I mean, that's that's part of what I was trying to get at here. Also, as someone who's been, you know, studying social media and protests for years, you always get this kind of pushback. Oh, does the social media, the social media really matter? So I'm always interested to hear what other people have to say about this. And I think part of it is a very pragmatic standpoint, because if it's like social media is actually part of what's driving this, then things like takedown orders and shutting down the internet and these sorts of things have an effect. If it's just merely a window in which we can see what's going on, then those kind of measures are likely to be less, are likely to be less, um, less effective or, or even, you know, missing the point here. So thanks very much for your answers. I really appreciate it. It leads nicely into a few questions that we've gotten um, in the Q&A around the question of Putin's response. Right, so Piotr, you bring up the point of shutting down the internet, right? Uh, you know, so when we think about large, when we think about larger questions about this is something I've done a lot of work on on ways and tools in which authoritarian regimes can respond to online opposition, right? Shutting down the internet is a pretty drastic one because we know going back to I can't remember maybe Yana's point or Gulnas's point about how it's or impossible now or Piotr, you made the point about how it's becoming harder and harder to not notice the protests, right? When you have people scattering all over instead of being in one square, more people see it. Well, you shut down the internet, right? Obviously that's going to lead to lots of people realizing that something is going on. And it also causes pain to a lot of your population that may have no nothing to do with the protest. So that's always considered a very, very drastic event here. Um, but one question we got was, you know, why do you think Putin reacted the way he did? If he would have ignored or dismissed the palace expose, everyone would have just carried on as usual. But by escalating the crackdown, Putin seems to have created a counter reaction that was completely unavoidable. Why completely avoidable? Why do you think he is acting so much uh, so counterintuitively? So I think with the audience and I would like to hear a little bit more about this question of, you know, what's going on here. And I think we in the West, we often have this like, um, in the United States, there's often this kind of Putin, the master puppeteer who nothing he does is ever wrong. And whatever he does, it was part of a larger kind of master plan and everything like that. But a little bit more here on sort of on, on is the, you know, Golna, as you mentioned, you know, this is showing signs of, of repression here. And Yana, you brought up, you know, what was happening here. But is this, you know, is this like, is this strategy likely to continue? Is, you know, why do we think Putin reacted so quickly? Is this a growing sign that his back is more up against the wall? And if we had, say, Sergei Goryev and Dan Treisman here, you know, they might be suggesting that this is the fact that they're reacting with more and more repression is a sign that traditional methods aren't working as well, or what's driving the strategy here? So Yana, I don't know, maybe you, if you want to take first shot at that one. Sure. What's, what, get into Putin's mind. That's yeah. that's an easy one, Josh. Thanks. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so a couple of things have surprised me, right? So one of the things that I think a question that has been posed uh, in this uh, theme of what is Putin thinking has been, you know, why was Navalny poisoned when he was um, in August? And some people have proposed that maybe it's the, the smart vote system. Um, I'm more inclined to believe uh, the Bellingcat reporting, which is that they probably tried to poison him a couple of different times, and this is this is the one that took. Um, you know, he reports Navalny reports being sick before uh, his wife has reported being sick with sort of similar symptoms, um, and we know that Novichok kind of dosage from reporting is is hard to calibrate. Um, so I don't think that the timing itself is that um, significant for for this. For the for August, but why does what I'm what I'm more surprised about is the take up by Putin and those close to him of the information that was revealed in the palace video. So it is surprising that Putin felt the need to actually answer a question, you know, in this in this um, day of the student interview with with a university student about how this is in his palace. You know, he he you know made a point of saying he hasn't seen the video, but what he's heard about it, you know, and he can assure you that this is in his palace. And then, you know, and then the, they they more or less kept the story alive by 
uh, you know, sending pro pro regime reporters up there to demonstrate that this isn't a palace, but some like unfinished hotel. And then, you know, uh, and a close associate of Putin and oligarch then then, you know, drew the short straw and actually claimed ownership of this um, of this palace. So that to me is surprising. And that actually, I think, speaks to Navalny and his his team um, and his YouTube channel and his message penetrating society. So this seems now to be important enough that the government has to respond to it directly and not just spin a bunch of propaganda about it. I mean, obviously their response is propaganda, but um, so I do think, uh, you know, the messaging, Navani's messaging, his anti-corruption kind of videos are having an effect on society um, to, the, to the degree that the, the regime actually wants to respond to it. Um, you know, to what, what, you know, what that response will spark in society, I think that's a different question. You know, repression sometimes breeds moral sol solidarity and more people will attend protests. Sometimes it works to depress um, voter turnout or a protest turnout. Um, and I do think it's significant that most of Navalny's team is now in prison or at home arrest, but off social media, off the internet. And I think that that will actually have, have an effect on protests. And I'll just leave it there. Yep. So hey, we're- please. Do we have anyone else on that one who wanted to jump in? Yeah, I can jump yeah. in. Uh, I think the consensus is that yeah. the Kremlin and Putin's response have been ineffective. Uh, and indeed, uh, they are contrary to the patterns of response to the previous films, and especially when we talk about Medvedev's uh, 2017 house with, uh, with a little ducky, which didn't get any response from the Kremlin, and there, were, there was a response uh, in the society with protests in March 17. And uh, my only answer is just the, um, the geometrical progression with which the, the documentary was watched, that it became such a big event with people logging in on YouTube and watching it and over hours, many people uh, uh, reporting how many millions have watched it in the first couple of hours and in the three days, etc. Just the, uh, the intensity of the audience, the size of the audience was so big that I think it was decided, uh, you know, uh, the, the press services, uh, the administration that they have to respond somehow. Great, so moving on from Putin, let's put the emphasis now on Navalny. We've gotten a bunch of different Navalny related questions. Uh, some are questioning his view, uh, most notably uh, about immigrants. Um, there are some questions about his support for Crimea's annexation. Clearly Alexei Navalny is not classically, uh, you know, Western liberal in a lot of his uh, types of political viewpoints. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's one part that I think, you know, Western audiences would be interested in sort of hearing about. Uh, and then the second part of that uh, comes from a question that's asked by Cynthia Hooper, um, which is a good one about what's Navalny's end game here in as far as we can see him? Is he overestimating the power of the people or is this not about street mobilizations? Um, is he trying to do something else? So, uh, Piotr, why don't we start with you, just because also coverage of Navalny, I think, is such an interesting issue, especially in the West, the way he's sort of, you know, yeah. framed and pigeonholed, and then anyone else who wants to pick up on him uh, can. Yeah, um, we actually, in the most times, we wrote a feature today on Navalny's views uh, and how they've developed. Um, it's, it is interesting how when you, when you write about Navalny, uh, wh whether you always have to sort of bring in this caveat that, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, he said a lot of, uh, you know, ra uh, you could say racist, you know, uh, xenophobic stuff. He was, you know, in, uh, uh, actively anti-immigrant. Um, but uh, what's important is also to, to notice his, his uh, political journey and his development. Um, if you look at his platform uh, of 2000, uh, when he tried to run for president in 2018, um, you could see really that he does not really go into any of the nationalism that was so prevalent beforehand. Uh, I've talked a lot to uh, Navalny's allies, uh, including Sergei Guriev, Shukhov, and others. They've they they say that Navalny sort of has distanced himself from nationalism. That it's not something that's interesting to him anymore. Uh, at the same time, Navalny himself hasn't um, in interviews when given the chance. He never apologized for it. Uh, he said that was his views then um, without really going into more details. 
Um, I think now what's interesting is to look at his current program, what he you know, presented in 2018. Uh, it, it's, it's a left, in some ways, quite left program uh, economically. He proposes a minimum wage. Uh, he's been in favor of unions, for example, as well. Um, at the same time, his advisors, many of them are sort of open market liberals. Um, um, so, you know, he's a very interesting character in that sense because he sort of has, he goes both left and right wing. You know, some call him a populist as well because obviously right now the big issue is the economy, is low, low wages. Um, so you can't really place him in, in the traditional left-right uh, way, the way we do with other politicians uh, in, in, in Europe. Um, I hope that sort of helped explaining a little bit uh, where, where Navalny stands. Yeah, Jana, do you want to jump in on Navalny here? Yeah, I just, I, I think that the, the article of the Moscow Times that summarizes Navalny's career is, is quite informative. People should check that out. Um, I just add that I think there is a split or there's a difference between the conversation that's happening in Western media, which is sort of, you know, is Navalny Nelson Mandela or is he a racist? Um, that is not a conversation that is happening uh, in Russia as much. Um, and that's because the struggle that Navalny is in right now is not kind of a, a left right kind of platform struggle, right? His main, his main um, point is that corruption is a huge problem in Russia um, and it is an appeal, kind of a, a populist appeal to say that, you know, corruption is a problem not because it makes a few people rich, but because it makes you poor. Um, and so this, these other details, I think they are really important and I understand why people find them interesting. And yes, indeed, he, didn't, he did, hasn't um, condemned the annexation of Crimea, although he has said that it was a violation of international law. He has made xenophobic and racist statements. You know, he does advocate for um, border controls of visa regime with the Central Republic uh, countries, which Russia doesn't have at the moment. Um, but I, did, I think that kind of sometimes when we talk about this, we focus, we look at Russia through the lens of sort of um, American or European political platforms. So. Great. Josh, do you want to take it up? Sure. Um, so we've got a, a, a lot of, a ton of questions coming in. So we're going to try to get through as many of these as we possibly can. Um, just to give a heads up, we've got a bunch more about TikTok. We've got some big things coming about uh, elite level defections and regime change, which we'll get to in a bit. But I want to start with a question from Elise Giuliano, who is asking about, and, and just something we haven't really touched on here right now. We, we've talked a lot about Putin. We've talked a lot about Navalny. Um, Elise writes, great panel. The protest messages that I've seen seem highly focused on Putin. Picking up on Alexandra's last point that people may start to mobilize around the issue of police violence against protesters, has anyone observed any discourse during protests on so, or on social media blaming local authorities or blaming governors or local police with regard to any political issue? Relatedly, are the cities with harsh, rep harsh responses that we've seen like St. Petersburg and Kazan a function of where the journalists are located or is something else happening there? And in a sort of broader sense, you know, if we can just dive into a little bit more on this topic of the sort of geographic dispersion of what's going on here. So is the geographic dispersion, is it the same protest taking place all over the country, really focused on the palace, really focused on Navalny, or is this like now becoming an, an, an issue where grievances or differences are different based on different places? And then, you know, uh, you know uh, Alexandra, you also mentioned that one video, the most popular video was from Chita, right? Like, are we seeing differential responses from local authorities to these protests? And is that likely to be part of the story? So interested in anyone who wants to, for anyone who wants to jump in there, maybe Piotr, if you want to take first crack at that. So the, the first question uh, on whether we, we've seen different responses in different areas. Yeah, and whether people, there's any sign of people blaming local authorities as well, or is this very much still mm -hmm. a kind of nationalized protest movement on a kind of Putin versus Navalny. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now at this point, I would, I would say it's still quite nationalized. Um, this is sort of what you, what you see in, in, in uh, the responses, but obviously each region has its own sort of uh, grievance. Uh, for example, in Yekaterinburg, uh, there's been six, 7,000 people coming out. Um, and amongst them has been uh, Yevgeny Roisman, the former mayor of the city was quite popular. And uh, there, you know he was sort of welcomed, and there were supporters around him, taking people taking pictures with him. So there's all this grievance that, that you can't 
have uh, your mayor anymore uh, and the people that were angry back then are sort of coming out now. Um, what's interesting is Khabarovsk uh, is a very interesting case example. Obviously, Khabarovsk saw massive protests over the summer uh, because they, uh, because their, the mayor Frugal was um, arrested, obviously. Um, and Khabarovsk almost saw, saw no, no protests in the streets. So sort of all that anger that was there then didn't materialize in anti-Putin anger now. So sort of it's really case by case and it's quite hard to make one generalized um, conclusion at this point, I would say. Anyone else on the local dimension? Yeah, Gulnaz. Uh, I think uh, to respond to your first question about whether it's national or there are local, the only place where I saw the local element being discussed by observers was in St. Petersburg, trying to explain why there is such an intensity and size of protests in St. Petersburg that the disapproval and criticism of the local authorities might play a role there. But in terms of the slogans to Elisa's questions, I haven't seen any very specific, uh, you know, local authority motivated or uh, directed to slogans. It's a lot on Putin. It's a lot on we are the power, everyone for all, uh, one for all, everyone for one, uh, things like that. So uh, as I mentioned, I think there is, uh, first of all, of course, you know, there is an organization and uh, Navalny team working uh, across across the country and gathering uh, with specific, uh, you know, free Navalny anti-Putin, anti-corruption type message. Um, but we do see a different reaction from the Silaviki as to how they manage protests. And I think the one thing that explains the difference is that in smaller cities, you have more permissive police or at least a police that doesn't you know, start beating people simply because of the community uh, and people knowing each other very closely and having to live together while in the you know, uh, bigger cities, you have the anonymity that is required for the repression to go uh, a bit simpler. And there is one place where the protest uh, on 31st was actually allowed officially, I think in Magadan, uh, the one city in Russia where it was a, a sanctioned protest, all other places, the, the protests were unsanctioned. But we do see the, at least some differences, right, in terms of both the level of violence in Chita, as someone mentioned already, there was no violence. So in Perim, for example, there is a, um, you know, more allowance for peaceful protests to happen. So we do see those differences across the country. Thanks, Piotr and Gunas, uh, very much. I'm going to switch gears back now to social media. We've got a bunch more social media questions. So a, a few questions for Alexandra. Um, the first one is from Eleanor Mace. It is a little more on the technical side, which is that wondering again on TikTok, um, you know, that you've shown this peak in videos after the 23rd. Is it possible there's a different set of hashtags? that are now appearing after the 23rd. And so it, can this be an API type issue? And then, um, and I know from a little bit of, of dealing with, of, of getting some preliminary information about the TikTok API that hashtags may not be necessarily as, as central to the memes as, uh, as uh, songs are and as the background music is. And so I don't know if you have you've been doing anything in terms of, again, A, following whether there are uh, songs or background music for it that is, you know, that is, that, and then did that change after the 23rd as we moved into this period of protest? So are there potentially, I guess the question would be, are there potentially some technical reasons for seeing the drop off as opposed to people actually are less uh, less interested in using TikTok at this particular time. Then we also have a, and that was from Eleanor Mace raised that issue. And then we also have a question uh, from, I'm going to butcher this names, uh, Weimar's Marielle, oh, apologies for, for messing that up if I got it wrong, um, which has to do with the, the, you know, the extent, which says the extent of pressure from uh, Roskamzar on the social media platforms ahead of the 23rd of January protest was unprecedented, yet still re relied on the state to identify content and ask the platforms to take it down. So with the new law that came into effect on social media today, switching responsibility to the platforms to protectively identify and block content, do we think that that's going to lead to changes in what's happening on the social media platforms here? And that, I would open that up more generally uh, to others if they have comments on that. And then the final question comes from uh, Natalia Krapiva, uh, Krapiva who, um, who asks, you know, 
do you still see independent of this, the getting people out to the protest, do you see TikTok playing some role in Russia in terms of, of providing a platform for organizing targeted disrupt, disruptions with the example being what TikTokers did to the Trump rally in Tulsa? So is, do we see anything going on here that's beyond just the way we normally think of social media in terms of providing inspiration or information about protests to these kind of targeted uh, TikTok activities? And I guess I'll just throw in, right, is there a possibility that we see K-pop fans getting involved, right, in Russian protests as well and some other, you know, other things of those kind of TikTok-y type natures of social media and protests? So I threw a ton out there for you, but jump in wherever you want. Um, yeah, okay, I will, I will start, start with the first like uh, technical question. Uh, yeah, I'm also tracking a number of hashtags and a number of uh, music clips, but I thought that my slide deck was already like barely fitting into 10 minutes. Um, so I put only the Navalny hashtag. Now we also see the deck line on the others. Uh, there is a bit of a less of the deck line on the meeting or like rally in English hashtag, but it's difficult to disentangle that one without qualitative analysis because people in Belarus also use that one and some of them are like of these hashtags are from uh, you know like previous videos related to uh, Habarovsk and people like and some of the pro-Putin accounts also use that one so that's why I explicitly relied on Navalny here because this was you know easier to kind of disentangle uh, from the noise in the data. In terms of the sounds, yes, the sounds are used. I'm also looking at the sounds, but again, this need to be um, analyzed in context with qualitative analysis, because sometimes the same sounds are used in uh, non-political contexts. Um, so again, with change of sounds ahead of the protests, for example, uh, there were a couple of songs that were used on a lot of protest videos. What I found interesting was that a lot of people use, like if you have if you have seen this video of Navalny and his wife boarding the plane where Yulia Navalny takes off her mask and says this famous quote from the Brother 2 movie, like, uh, hey, did bring us some vodka, we are flying home uh, in my, you know, <laughs> translation. I don't know how it's properly translated. This one was super popular as a background sound, sometimes mixed with some music uh, ahead of the protests. And after the protests, in all of this, like, you know, police violence um, and people fleeing from the police, it's obviously the... Uh, uh, 90s or early 2000s famous Russian uh, music group Tattoo, T-A-T-U, uh, with the song They Won't Catch Us, uh, or like for the Russian speakers, Nas Nie um, which uh, is also used in other contexts. So it takes like, you know, if there is like uh, no decline in activity, I can't disentangle without looking through dozens of TikToks, whether it's uh, still everything political or not, that's why. Um, and in terms of targeted uh, actions, I actually think that TikTok might be good for targeted actions through like what we have seen with the Trump rally, but not for sustained mobilization, as I said, because the trends shift quickly. But for quick targeted actions, I think we might see something like that in the future, not just in Russia, but beyond. And what was the final question about the Roskomnadzor, uh, right? About the platform responsibility. I think it's super interesting. I wouldn't predict much here because well, so I guess TikTok will actively bow to the Russian authorities because TikTok is a Chinese company, largely. Um, I'm not completely sure with Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as a subsidiary of Google because these are American companies. And I guess, like, my hunch would be that uh, the executives, if it comes to it, uh, will have to assess the, co like the cost and benefit of paying these enormous fines in Russia versus will it uh, lead to a massive public outcry in the West, largely? And with Telegram, I don't see Pavel Durov bowing to Russian authorities anytime soon, basically. So I guess there it won't affect much. There was like this very um, interesting case, if, if you have seen, um, like there are a couple of Telegram channels that are collecting personal data of police involved in, uh, allegedly involved in the beatings or arrests of protesters, both in Belarus and in Russia, and these Telegram channels exist. Uh, they are not blocked, and uh, even though they publish personal data. But once, right after I think the 23rd, the Telegram channel appeared that collected personal data of people who were fighting the police or who participated in the protests. Uh, it was very swiftly taken down by the Telegram team, and I guess this is ideological moderation. Um, yeah. And that's why I also don't see Telegram bowing to 
the Russian authorities anytime soon. Well, Naz, you want to quickly weigh in? Uh, yes, I wanted to add two points about TikTok from my observations before January 23rd. Uh, I was, um, you know, I saw the, talking about the musical background, a lot of uh, kids using the song of this singer face with specific place which says being critical of authorities doesn't mean being critical of a motherland. And this message I think is really important because it goes exactly against the Kremlin's messaging that patriotism and love for Putin is one. Right, so uh, the the TikTok messaging now seems to have sort of broken up that that Kremlin's message. The second point we have not discussed, and I think is worth of considering, is the role of social influencers and how they are also in some ways pressured to take political positions. And we do know that on Instagram and TikTok, the biggest social influencers have been apolitical. We have seen politicization of people like Yuri Dudes and things like that. But now with, you know, you seem to have a cultural sphere and the singers and uh, rap and hip hop and uh, all those guys, but also famous bloggers actually trying to take a position and uh, the role of social influencers on social media in these political events, I think is turning into something mm -hmm. also an interesting um, happening as of now. Thank you. We just can't get through all the questions, but there's so many good ones. So I wanna switch now to the question of uh, this anti-corruption narrative, anti-corruption activism. So uh, Maria Rojova asked, does the anti-corruption narrative have the power to create a cross-sectional, cross-generational coalition in Russian society? Um, could it accumulate and combine existing political grievances or would it have to formulate new issues? And then uh, right after that, Harley Balser reminds us, Navalny's video was about a lot more than the palace. Is Putin trying to dodge the far broader indictment by letting Rottenberg claim ownership? Doesn't that point to precisely what the video is trying to demonstrate? So Jana, let's go to you first. What do you think about anti-corruption as a mobilizing issue and about some of the dynamics of the video and its fallout? Yeah, so I mean, to think back to the protests, you know, I didn't in my comments, my original comments, I didn't really want to kind of talk about the history of protests in Russia. But I think, you know, sometimes we lose a little bit of perspective by looking at each individual instance of protests. But corruption has been a big theme um, in protests in Russia, not only uh, to do with Navalny, organized by Navalny, you know, the pension, the protest reforms around the or protests around the pension reforms of 2018 were, uh, I think, indicative of how, um, of how galvanizing the issue of corruption is, because here you had, you know, for people who aren't familiar, Putin is reelected in March of 2018 to the presidency, and the finally is uh, excluded from the ballot because of this, um, this conviction that he has uh, in the Ibra Shar case. And then uh, almost immediately, Putin um, announces that the pension system is in need of reform, which, which it is uh, and was. Um, and they announced that they will raise the retirement age. And one of the um, kind of problems there is that the retirement age for men also, the new retirement age for men also uh, coincides with men's life, life expectancy. So um, essentially, you know, people then talk about how you uh, will work until you die and then you don't need a pension anyway. Um, and protests erupt very quickly afterwards. Uh, there's also the World Cup going on at that time, but protests uh, protests start happening and the message in the protests, and we see actually a really big coalition uh, across generations and across um, occupations and across political views of people who come out to protest against the pension reform. And the claim that they're making is that they don't trust the government uh, to do the reform in a way that will actually be beneficial to people. They say, you're going to make us work longer and you're going to steal the money anyway. And Putin, again, we forget about this, but in an unprecedented um, event, Putin actually comes out and goes on television in August of 2018 to defend the reforms. And he rolls back the retirement age from the proposals, right? They're still raised, but he rolls back the, the age and he defends publicly the reform. He takes ownership of it. Um, and then we see in the regional elections that happened in September of that same year that the first time ever, um, you know, three or four uh, governors from United Russia actually lose, lose elections 
including in Khabarovsk, which is where Sergei Furgal is elected and who has been, uh, who was removed in July of 2020 and where we see those protests. So I think that anti-corruption is in fact a really powerful message in Russia that has the potential to build coalitions. Um, you know, the degree to which it has the power to kind of maintain protests over time, I think is difficult to judge. Again, the protests of 2017, 2018 died out. Um, but we did see them have political effects, especially on in the regional elections. And so the question I think for the authorities and for protest organizers is how much of what's happening now will affect the the, 20, the September 2020 or September 2021 Duma elections, right? The state Duma elections that are scheduled for September of this year. United Russia's popularity is at 30%. So they're going to need all the help they can get. And this uh, corruption message has the potential to motivate a protest vote. I'll stop there. Yeah. Can I just quickly add? Yeah, I think yeah. I, I I agree with Jana. Uh, the corruption can be sort of a unifying topic, but uh, I don't believe that Navalny uh, will be that person to lead that movement across ages because his uh, popularity and approval among older people is just very very low. Um, there's several reasons. Most uh, most notably is the the TV uh importance for the older generation and you know Navalny's name has been completely you know destroyed on state propaganda so on state tv uh so i don't believe that Navalny will be able to majorly change the way the older population looks at him uh in in, in the nearby future because it, the numbers have been stagnant they're not going up his uh, popularity ratings um, so in that sense corruption can play a role but will navalny lead that movement across ages and 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 social classes i'm not I, i'm not sure okay so we oh go all right go ahead i wanted to bring a bit of point of disagreement um and to suggest that actually navalny has been criticized for only pushing corruption message and that the more resonant message would be the issue of social justice and inequality and that corruption becomes important in that frame of social injustice and inequality in russia which really resonates really well while perceptions of corruption as a systemic problem that's not going to that's not going to go away is one of those big frames that many people in russia do share that do, do not believe that it is possible to bring in new state officials who will be non-corrupt. So that pessimism with regard to the systemic nature of corruption actually undermines the mobilizational uh, potential of the corruption messaging. So I think it's important to, to, to keep that in mind and compare with other potential. And Navalny has understood that very well, and he has been moving in the direction of pointing out the injustices and inequality. Yeah, that, that has been his move afterwards uh, and his program as well, proposing minimum wage, unitizing, uh, you know, proposing unions. So he's been sensitive to that, to move away from just a corruption message, uh, as Gurna said. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. All right. So we're rapidly running out of time. We've got a little bit more than five minutes left at, the, uh, at this hour. Thanks to all of you who've stuck with us this far. Um, I, I think for the final question, we, we said we weren't going to ask you to predict the future and we're trying to do more of analysis of what we've seen already, but we do have a lot of questions sort of on this kind of larger regime level and larger societal level questions moving forward. So I'm going to try to bundle four of these together and, and give each of you a minute to respond. And if there's something else you wanted to say, that's fine. Uh, and don't feel compelled to respond to all of them together. But here are a bunch of different questions. So from Stephen Wilson has asked, you know, are we, as, as, as a good comparative comparativist would, uh, are we beginning to see any signs of elite level defection, right? Yana, you had mentioned that, you know, you need elite cohesion for repression. How close do we think we are to seeing potentially elite defection? Uh, Joshua Rubenstein brings up this idea that people have started talking about, are we, are we entering a period of Brezhnev again, where kind of nothing's happening, old elites, uh, stag economic stagnation, are we in the sort of period of Brezhnev or is this, is this different? Um, and then two questions from anonymous attendees, uh, one asking the question of how much, a sense of how much polarization there is on this issue. Like we've been mainly talking about society from the point of view of the protesters, but are there sort of passionate feelings on the side of in society that are opposed to the protesters that see this as causing problems? And to the extent that is this sort of a global, is this, is Russia part of this, you know, becoming part of this global phenomenon of increased political polarization? And then finally, a last question from uh, anonymous attendee, 
about sort of drawing the contrast and comparison to the Belarusian the momentum we seem to see around protests in Belarus. Now, maybe it's too early to answer that question in Russia, but if there already was a drop off from week one to week two, although we don't know what the difference in the weather was as I watched this blizzard in New York City here between week one and week two in most of these places. But, you know, do we see a, a, a Belarusian pass forward for Russia and, and potentially why not if it's already sort of doesn't look like it's gonna be there? So a lot of big systemic level questions. Uh, feel free to jump into any of them. And why don't we go just to wrap up, we'll go in the order that we did at the beginning here. So Yana, do you want to kick off the discussion and ask everyone to take about a minute to ruminate on some of this? Yeah, so um, have we seen elite defection? So um, to go back to a previous question, yeah, this question about the uh, palace video being more, more than just about the palace, and that's absolutely correct. The, the palace video was interesting, not only because it gave you this like really cool 3D go inside of um, Putin's palace and see the, you know, the hookah lounge with a stripper pole kind of thing. Um, what was interesting about it is that it laid out exactly how Putin and those close to him were able to amass a fortune and his, his sort of from his, his days in, in Dresden in East Germany and all the way through his time in the St. Petersburg government and then his move to Moscow and his rise to the federal government. Um, you know, and the Navani team has said that they had that information for quite a long time, but it was really, really boring. So, you know, this paper trail was really boring and then they got these blueprints to the palace and they were able to sort of put it together in a much more Kind of appealing um, video. So what I think is interesting about that part of the video is that it highlights not only Putin but some of his say 10, 12, 15 closest associates and it really puts them in the spotlight and it's not things we don't know necessarily about them but it does put them in the in the spotlight and it asks them um, or it 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 shifts the risk over to them, or it shifts, it shifts attention over to them. And we've already seen, so we've seen, you know, the, this, the ownership of the palace uh, uh, expressed publicly. We saw Putin talk about um, a couple of other people publicly that he admires and that he works with and that, you know, maybe he, he has a retirement plan to work with them. Um, so, so far, I don't see a lot of elite uh, defection and, and I don't see kind of, the pressure on the elite to abandon Putin, right? I mean, things might change, but it doesn't seem like, it seems like they're more in the spotlight now, but that hasn't caused them to kind of um, move away from him. Um, in yeah, terms of- you off, because uh, we're almost out of, out of time. Sure, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick, quick, uh, quick about the elites. I think very important uh, to see what will happen uh, if the West actually sanctions those that Navani wants to see sanctions uh, and these aren't the Siloviki or St. Petersburg friends of Putin but Abramovich and Usmanov and other oligarchs and the, the, the question is if they will get sanctions whether that they, that will only bring them closer to Putin or uh, push them away from Putin when they realize that their personal fin finances are in danger that's a question we don't know yet but I think it's very important to, to look at. A uh, quick question about polarization um, I don't think we've Russia hasn't reached or never had the levels of, you know, political activity we see in the West. Uh, you know, where in you know Trump's America, families couldn't sit at the same table. Uh, Russians have traditionally been quite apolitical. Uh, it's a society that never really had that much agency. Um, but you see, politics is becoming a much bigger part of daily discourse. Uh, whether it's Instagrammers, musicians, artists, everyone sort of speaking out. It's cool now to speak out. Um, and with speaking out, you take a position. So I foresee that there will be more discussions, more fights as well. Uh, but society is sort of waking up to political reality, I would say. That's for me. Piotr, thanks so much. Uh, Golnas. Uh, very quickly, uh, although observers are talking about Putin becoming a liability from being an asset, uh, we haven't yet seen elite defections, although we do see Vexelberg discussing how many mil milliard, one billion and a half being yes. frozen in the uh, accounts. So we do see that, but uh, we haven't seen yet elite defection. On the uh, social political polarization, uh, that's a very good question. And um, that's very important to talk about because uh, I think it is happening and despite the fact that you know the social media and you know the future belongs to the younger generations we do have about 50 52 percent of the population that uh, trusts tv and the propaganda on tv does frame 
protests in very dangerous terms as mobs, as uh, bringing in the reality of Ukraine that is very much feared and the animosity and sort of the just the, the Kremlin propaganda is directing the grievances and the hatreds and the ang anger towards the uh, people who are on the streets. And I don't know numbers for sure, but I'd say anywhere between a fifth to fourth of the population probably is sharing and and listening closely to what Kisilov and Salavyov and their framing uh, does resonate. Great. Um, Alexander? Um, yeah, I guess I will address the Belarus related question then. Um, I guess the difference right now is also that the protests were triggered by two very different political events of very different magnitude. So Belarusians have seen like what they perceive at least as elections stolen from them, presidential elections. In Russia, what happened now, like over the past two weeks, it was like basically Navalny initiated event. So Navalny coming back to Russia and being arrested, like he probably expected that, and Navalny and his team releasing the video. If like in a month we would have uh, presidential elections coming up and um, I don't know, let's say Navalny's wife would be allowed to run and then uh, Russians would perceive that uh, she actually won uh, and uh, in the end, like she got only 10, 20% officially, I guess we would see much larger protests. So I would expect larger protests to happen in September after Duma election, depending on how that goes. But yeah, that's a prediction. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank you all for this and for coming at short notice, sharing your insights, your research, your expertise. Thank you audience for sticking with us uh, throughout your lunchtime and well beyond. And let me just mention, you can check both the calendars of the Harriman Institute and the Jordan Center for different events. Um, our next joint event in this series will be March 8th, possibly something on vaccine politics. Um, you know, thanks again, and we shall see you very soon. And thank you as well to Josh and all the staff who make this happen behind the scenes, uh, Sasha and Carly um, as well. Bye everyone. <laughs>